Yeah, so you can mute yourselves. I think I can. Okay, welcome. Um, tonight we have Amy Pryor from Towson University from their ADS, Accessibility and Disability Services. And we have Michael Shaw from CCBC, and he is with their Student Accessibility Services. They call it SAS there. We're very appreciative that you were able to join us, especially this time of year as our seniors are getting ready to go to college. So um, they are here tonight to explain their disability support services. And we are gonna have Amy Pryor from Towson begin. Thank you. So, All right, here we go. So um, as she mentioned, I am Amy Pryor. I'm a disability specialist at Towson University in the Accessibility and Disability Services Office. Uh, we support all students on campus that have documented disabilities. So I have three main things on my agenda, an overview of disability services in higher ed, current trends in disability services offices, and then our application process as well. So one of the big differences between high school and college is there's a, a huge disconnect um, when a lot of students first come to college because they're used to sitting in the classroom for six consecutive hours in a day, whereas in college you're in class for about 12 hours a week, and then you have the homework outside of class instead of a little bit of homework after school, you have a lot more homework that you're doing independently. Um, one of the other things is that that syllabus is provided to you at the beginning, and and it's not provided by the teachers. It's, the syllabus is given to you typically on Blackboard, um, kind of like the at school we in BCPS, I know you guys use a, a learning management system. Um, and so the assignments are provided there on a daily basis, um, more often, whereas in college, you'll get that syllabus at the very beginning of the semester. The professor will go over it with the students, but that's really the expectation that you have that syllabus and you pay attention to it. And that's where you're getting all of your deadlines and, and test dates and things like that. The other thing is um, access to teachers is definitely different from high school to college. You're gonna see that your professors are typically available. You can see them every day of the week when you're in the high school. Whereas in college, a lot of the times they have posted office hours or have um, a lot of them have like an online platform for you to, for students to request when they need to meet with the professor. And then the study time is the same thing. Since you spend more time in class in high school, you have less independent study that's required outside of school. And they typically give you some more of those like structured study guides for those students at that point. Whereas in college, it's much more independent study time. It varies between two to three hours per class hour. So um, that study time is much more cumbersome outside of the classroom in college. And I think one of the things that, that students struggle with is that balance of, of switching from being in class all the time to having all this free time, but it's not actually free time. They still need to be using that time for studying. In high school, most of the time, your support staff and support services are like included in your classroom and you have those special educators that are following you and, and helping you through all those struggles. Whereas in college, it is the student's responsibility to come to the ADS office or um, any of the other support services that are offered on campus to say, hey, I need help with this. Um, who do I go to? What's the best situation? What's the best thing to do? And then also just managing that personal life and academic balance is, is definitely a challenge between some students going from high school to college because your parents, your teachers, your coaches, your advisors, your school staff is all managing all of that 
day to day when you're in high school, whereas you're now responsible to manage all those tasks on your own as a college student. So a lot of things that those are a lot of things that we see initially coming in right in September, beginning of August, when students come in that they're like, oh, this is way different and I don't know how to structure these things. One of the big things that uh, we've definitely talked about in the past couple of years in ABS is that um, more than 50% of the students that we service in our Towson community at least is um, for mental health disorders. Um, and so some of those other things are, are becoming a smaller section than what they used to be. This is only taking into consideration the most impactful um, disability that students come to us with. A lot of times they're coexisting with multiple different things, but a lot of students kind of have this stigma that, you know, it's, it's not really that big deal. And the, that mental health and those ADHD things aren't, aren't really affecting me in the class. And, and we've noticed that in the past couple of years, it just continues to increase. And it's not just here on Towson's campus. I know um, we definitely look into other universities and colleges around the area, and this seems to be the trend. Mental health is just increasing significantly. And, and those are definitely things that, that we have some additional resources for as well. These are a couple of our statistics. Um, at Towson, we have 2,700 students that are registered with ADS. This was last year, which was about 14% of our student population. So we're definitely over 10%. This year, we've definitely increased as well. We see that this trend is continually, continually going up. Um, more students are hearing about us and uh, we're doing more events on campus that other students collaborating with other departments on campus that students are like going to these counseling center events and they're like, oh, ADS has this and they can help me with this in the classroom. And so we're getting some additional students from things like that. Um, one of the crazy statistics to me is that 63% of students on campus that have disabilities do not register with the Disability Support Office at college, um, whether they come in thinking, I don't need it, a lot of, like, um, it's different and I can do this on my own. Um, and so that staggering statistic shows that, that not every, we aren't reaching everybody and there's still potential for us to get to other students as well. Um, one of our biggest, uh, accommodations that that we provide to a lot of students is um, extended time on testing and our testing center um, last year this was last year was gave about 600 tests during a six-day final period and unfortunately it wasn't equal it wasn't 100 tests a day there was one day where we did about 250 tests and then there was other days where we only did 50 or so tests. So, um, but our testing center is always hustling and bustling. There's a lot of students that utilize the testing center, whether it's for uh, a reduced distraction environment or a um, just a less anxiety inducing um, environment. We have noise canceling headphones and white noise machines, things that also help the students to we we allow fidgets in there that we have provided. So there's there's some other things that just help students relax in that testing center and not have as much anxiety as all the other students around them taking those tests as well. So for us, our application process um, goes through filling out the application, submitting documentation, and then the student will meet with the specialist. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six specialists in our office. Um, everybody in our office does carry a caseload, including our leadership. So um, we all carry a caseload and do intake meetings. An intake meeting would consist of 
a meeting between 30 minutes to an hour with a specialist going over the impact of the disability and and really how things have changed for you, what things have worked, what things have not. Um, then we provide a letter of accommodation and the letter of accommodation is, it is the responsibility of the student to send that to their professors. One of the big things that we see people come through with a lot of questions about is the document. Hi, Amy? Yes. Hi, sorry. I just I have raised my hand. I just um, oh, I'm sorry. I yeah, I couldn't see. It. Go ahead. No, I totally understand. You, you, you it, no problem. Um, I just wanted to know, um, will the will these slides be available, or was it maybe you covered that before I signed on to the meeting? Um, I do know that it is being recorded, so um, it will be accessible on the Baltimore County Transition website. Cynthia, do you have more information yes. on that? Yes, it will be um, posted on our transition website eventually. Um, yeah, because I am recording it. But is there any way we can get a like you can get a copy to me and then I can send it? Yeah, definitely. OK. Thank you for your question, Michael. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you. So um, with our application process, it's pretty straightforward name, birth date, ID number, um, phone number, the current diagnosis. Um, the things that are real important to us are describing how your disability impacts you. Um, and it just says impacts you because we, not necessarily only in the classroom, but other things on campus as well. So, um, and then we do have some pretty common accommodations that, that we provide to students, like I mentioned, the use of the testing center. Um, we have audio recording device. Um, let's see. Um, we use our audio recording in place of most peer note takers because we found most of the times other students don't take the same notes that you want to take as a student. And so um, we've really embraced that. And a lot of students have shown real positive feedback on that. Uh, in the past year, we've used that and increased increased that a lot when students are like, oh, I didn't get the notes from the note taker or the note taker wrote down everything that was on the board and that is, didn't really apply to what I needed to know. I needed to know what the professor said compared to. So um, that audio recording piece has been really helpful to a lot of students. It has some built in additional features like being able to house your PowerPoint there as well or type your own notes in there as well. So then you kind of have everything all in the same space. Um, so a lot of students have liked that. And then the supporting documentation, whether from a healthcare provider or from a school, um, when it comes to documentation, that's where a lot of people have some questions. Um, 504s and IEPs are helpful, but they don't give us the full picture. So, we do ask for additional information as well. Um, they're very easily accessible on our Towson website, but um, I also, uh, at the end, I included contact information. So if you have any questions, you can email or call our office as well and get any of these documents if need be. Um, but for the 504 plan, we typically have a mental health verification form or a physical um, mobility verification form that can be filled out by a psychiatrist or a um, therapist, as well as any type of dad, excuse me, any type of doctor um, that states the diagnosis as well as the impact of the diagnosis on the student. Um, that gives us a better picture of a lot of people could have the same condition and it could show up very differently for each person. And then for those IEPs, students that have the learning disabilities and um, some of those that are a little more cumbersome to get other documentation for, um, we request any information from the schools that you have from the schools. So um, 
the educational assessment reports, including those test scores, like from the Woodcock Johnson, when you have a triennial report or anything like that, would be great information. So um, one of those things to do, parents and guardians, well, before those students are out of high school, um, is to contact your special ed chair or your IEP chair and get some of that information from them so that you're prepared for that when when that comes up. Um, it's not the, it's much more helpful for us to see a score to say, oh, this is where the impact is. We can see the discrepancies between these things comparatively to, oh, this person had this for the past six years. And a lot of times they, they can make those progressions and, and don't need that specific thing anymore. So um, one of the things we like to, to make known is that the student is a, a person and not a piece of paper. So instead of just reading all this documentation, getting to have that conversation and, and understand the student and the impact and, and how they're feeling about it. We do collaborate with a lot of other offices on campus. So the Counseling Center, we do some body doubling, which is like studying with other people in the room, not necessarily even working on the same thing, but it's something that's known to be helpful with ADHD. Uh, we have the Tutoring and Learning Center, the Writing Center, and then Academic Coaching. Uh, we have Academic Coaching by a grad student within our office, plus then we also work closely with the Academic, uh, the Tutoring and Learning Center with our Academic Coaching Department there. So a lot of things that students use on a regular basis with us. Amy, I have another question. Yeah. Sorry. Um, sorry. When I went to go ask the question, the TV got really loud, so I had to go turn it off. But it was about the previous um, page. Um, as far as the evaluations, uh, is there a limited time that you would take information or feel like information isn't recent enough? We try to say within three years because kind of like with the triennial report, um, things are always changing. So um, the results that you got from a student in fifth grade may not be the same results that you're seeing from that student as a senior in high school. Um, okay. But no, we, there are people that come in with absolutely no documentation and we'll talk to them and we'll help them figure out where they need to get documentation from or who they need to get documentation from, we can try to work with students on a provisional basis to see if those things can help them out initially um, before they're able to get that too. So we're not saying no, because you didn't, didn't have the most current documentation, we're not talking to you at all. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Uh, Denise Chandler has a question as well. Yes, Denise. <laughs> Good afternoon. I was just calling because I see that this meeting is more so addressed towards applying. Um, could you educate me on how I would follow up? I've already applied for a student. Yeah, so um, after a student applies, then we do an, a 30 to one hour meeting, intake meeting, communicating with the student. Um, and then the student receives their letter of accommodation. They send their letter of accommodation out to their professors and then at that point, it's up to the students how much assistance they need from us. Um, there are students that I don't see at all after that, and they get their letter of accommodation, and they get it to their professors, and they resubmit each semester to say, I need my letter of accommodation, and they don't come back. Um, there are also students who will be like, oh, this professor didn't give me my time and a half. Can you help? And I can also communicate and facilitate conversations between the student, the staff, and the faculty, and and make sure that the student gets the accommodations that they need. As well as um, sometimes, depending on the student, um, I've had a couple of students that would work with me on a starting on a weekly basis and then go down to a once a month basis on some future planning. Um, 
starting at the beginning of the semester, making sure we get all those assignments written on a calendar, getting an organization of a of a calendar planner system put together so that they're working on those things on a regular basis. And sometimes they continue to see me every week and sometimes they see me once every other month just as a checkup. And, and after that initial intake meeting, it is up to the students how much interaction they would like to have. Okay. I thank you. So I talked about our collaboration with other student uh, resources, and then really um, this is our main our main line for TUADS, as well as our email address. Um, so if you do have any questions specific to Towson, you can definitely reach out to us and let us know and we can help you out as quickly as possible. All of our um, staff are definitely working with those crazy finals and commencement at the moment, but this email address is monitored by all of us in, in the department. So that makes it a little easier to, to get an answer from. Okay, does anyone have anyone else have any questions for Amy before we move on to CCBC? Okay, thank you, Amy. I appreciate you um, giving us your time. And um, you can stick around for CCBC or you can go enjoy the rest of the day. It's up to you. I always want Mike's input on things, so I'm going to listen. <laughs> do you mind sharing your screen? Yes, That's let me great. get that. Okay. Okay, and then somebody, um, somebody's not on mute because we can hear some background noise. So if you could all just double check to make sure you're on mute before. Michael Shaw from CCBC begins. Guilty. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Tyler. All right, Mr. Shaw, you're on. Oh, again, my name is Michael Shaw. I'm the director of Student Accessibility Services here at the Community College of Baltimore County. Um, a lot of my information may seem redundant from what Amy presented because, again, we are following the same guidelines and the law, which is the American Disability Act. Um, one thing I would like to, to start off by saying, at Community College, we are off. We are a school of open enrollment. So when you go, maybe apply to Towson, uh, other four-year colleges, they have other guidelines to get into those institutions, with colleges and universities, they're a little different from community college. So students that come to community college, they may be able to get in the college um, a little easier. Um, based on any um, SAT scores, anything like that, that might uh, prevent them from going to a university or college right away. Um, but if there are no previous college credits, then you will need to take a placement test. Once you take that placement test in math or in English, then that will determine where you can start off to take college classes. If you score at a certain level, it's not a pass or fail test. Um, it would determine whether you need to take either remediation classes or you could take right into or start right into college level classes. What we come in is that if you are a student who are receiving commendations, that you would come to our office first um, upon um, once you get admitted to the college to determine whether or not you would like to seek accommodations to start classes, to start the placement test, and then also start your classes. So looking at the, um, the screen, um, Again, Amy mentioned some of this already about difference between high school and college. One thing I do want to point out again about students within K through 12, they are set up with the IDEA, which is basically the um, individuals with 
Individuals with Disability Education Act. That is their prime source of what protects them from K through 12. That's about receiving a free education, about being successful, and also, you know, matriculating through K through 12. So the premise, again, I'd say the word successful, but you're about, about being successful in K through 12. And that is the goal of, of individuals in high school who are receiving a plan such as in 504 IEP. Um, when you transition to college, that plan transitions to an, an, an um, do the plan of the ADA, which is the American Disability Act. And when you when the focus at that point, the focus is, is on equal access. And that's where we seem to run into a lot of difficulty when students transition. Because we have kind of like we had to reprogram these students because they are so used to um, maybe a, getting redos, maybe not getting some, um, not getting, have lengthy extensions to get things done and so forth. But again, the goal, the focus is on success. Um, when you get to our, our level, the community college, or maybe even at the university level, there are guidelines. They have to follow very strict guidelines. So students will have a syllabus to look at and also will see time frames to get things done. And that's where we come in for as reasonable accommodations. That's where we talk to these students during our intake meetings about reasonable accommodations when to get things done. Because the premise here is not again about success on our level, it's about equal access. Um, again, Amy mentioned most of the other stuff, I, so I'm not gonna um, be, um, go into all that again, because that's we've already talked about that. Um, as far as accommodations, you know, we're looking at it as far as the word accommodation, it's a modification or adjustment to an academic policy or procedure. So again, we're looking at, again, reasonable accommodations. We can't um, modify a class that's already has been scheduled, but we can provide reasonable accommodations to a class. Um, accommodations are tailored to meet individual needs for students. Um, accommodations are not retroactive. That's very important. We always go over that with students over and over again because the same students seem to think that, hey, I forgot to come see you guys um, in the beginning of the semester, but I just found out about the office and I'm failing. Um, it is the mid semester, midpoint, and I need I need your services. And uh, I took two tests already, I'm failing. So I just wanna go back and take those two tests again so I can be up to par. No, I'm sorry. Um, accommodations are not retroactive. So they start by the time you're approved by a uh, coordinator or counselor in the office. And then once you're approved for those accommodations, we send those those memos, accommodation letters or accommodation memos directly to the teachers so they're aware of your accommodations. And then we send you to send those students also a copy so that they also can have that interactive conversation with the teacher to talk about implementation of, of um of an accommodation. Amy also talked about the testing center. So again, we also work closely with the testing center at CCBC, where so the students, we talk to them about having a conversation with the instructors, let them know when they will be taking their test in the testing center. So instructors can send their test to the testing center. Um, so again, there's an interactive conversation. That's what now it talks about implementation of accommodations. Um, Michael, sorry. Yeah. Uh, hi. Can you um, go back to that last slide? I just on the last line, I just read something that said um, <clears throat> that it cannot um, lower the course standards. Um, right. Can you delve a little bit more into that? Um, so, when, when a statement that, like that, we, we talk about maybe say, for instance, we're talking about um, a nursing program student. Student might be in in, in clinicals and they have flexible attendance. Um, There's so many hours that are needed in that program. I'm giving that for, for, for example, um, that the student has to be present in clinicals to the real life situation to work with a patient. And if for, for whatever reason, the student has a chronic medical condition that they are frequently absent to the point that it, it kind of starts to impede um, what needs to be done in that class. So we can't go back, even though we, we are providing reasonable accommodations, we can't change or lower the standards of that program to say, hey, the students missed 12 of your classes or is late 12 times. Can you can you still provide uh, leniency with that students so they can pass your class? If they, if they can't meet the technical standards of that class, then they it's not reasonable to be in an accommodation. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Some again, Amy mentioned some um, accommodations at Towson, and it's, it's it's across the board. Remember, accommodations are case by case. These are examples of typical accommodations on the board right now that you might see on a regular basis from 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 students that come to your office um, with specific diagnosis. But accommodations are case by case. So we have a student that comes to the office today who might need something totally different. I mentioned the word flexible attendance. So that, that student may need, because of chronic medical conditions, may flexible attendance. Um, the student might need the, um, the ability to, um, let's see, what else? Um, need a scribe in class because of um, mobi um, mobility issues or dexterity issues where they can't write for themselves and they, and they need to write for math. So it all depends on what, what that student's diagnosis is for some for some accommodation. So it's case by case. So you see that last statement there. If you go back one one second, um, accommodations are tailored to fit the individual needs of each student. Okay. So our process uh, is, very, is very similar to other institutions. Also, uh, process starts by actually going online to complete our online application. Once you complete that online application, and then you submit on one of those questions on the application is submitting documentation. That would be the IEP 504, a psyche eval, um, could be a medical um, letter from your uh, um, licensed professional. We need some type of documentation that has a diagnosis and some type of academic recommendations from that licensed professional to get started. Um, we don't, we cannot provide any accommodation unless we have something to go to go on. If individual is, is doesn't have an idea what is needed, just like Amy said on Towson's website, we also have on our website, it's called um, documentation guidelines to, to kind of guide the individual to know what is needed for documentation to take to their licensed professional. And that's and that's based on specific um, diagnosis. So it could be ADHD, we have guidelines for that, could be um, learning disability, could, we have guidelines for that. It could be um, psychological, could be um, deaf and hard of hearing. It could be, um, you know, um, any, any of the above. I just with some examples. We have our guidelines on on our website that you can follow if you're not sure what is needed for our documentation. Um, once we get that application, then within I would say we're asking for at least seven um, seven business days to get back to that individual based on what we are for us other individuals doing um, um, applications. Um, counsel or coordinator would then reach back to that individual to do a face-to-face -face or virtual appointment. And at that appointment, like I mentioned earlier, that's what we call the interactive process, where we took that counsel or that coordinator will talk to that student about what they what they provided as far as documentation and what they also self-disclose and some other things that they feel is, is needed for them to be successful and have equal access as a, as a student at Community College of Baltimore County. So once that process is done, then determine what's reasonable, the coordinator council will approve or deny accommodation based on what's, what's, what's being um, agreed upon during that meeting. And then a, a, a letter of accommodation is, is created and then sent by email directly to their, to, to their, to their teachers. Um, and also they get a copy, the student will get a copy of that same letter. Now, what we have had an issue over the years is that because students have an IEP with 504 plan in high school, they under the premise of they sit around a, a table with a team of individuals at that high school and everybody knows the, the, the plan for that student to be successful. So they all know the accommodations that's needed. And they come to our college thinking that's the same thing. And it's not. If a student does not self-disclose to our office, does not request an accommodation every semester, it's not just one semester, it's every semester that they register for classes, then their teachers do, are not aware of their accommodations. Um, so we have to actually talk to those students about this a lot because they don't they don't really, uh, they, think, they think the process is a one-time thing. The application process and approval process is a one-time thing unless health or medical issues change. So if health or medical, medical issues change, we can modify the 
and combinations without a problem. But if there's no changes, then the request has to come from that student every semester. And once did we get that request, because then we know the student is actually on campus, then we would send those letters to the instructors for, for the um, so instructors will know what their combinations are. And that's kind of the issues that we run into every semester with students sometimes forget. So we try to get them to understand this is their responsibility to self-advocate and to also, you know, be responsible of, of requesting these combinations every semester that they register for classes. Michael, I have a quick question. Sure. Could you give us an example of a case where an accommodation, a requested accommodation was denied? Uh, I guess I can say the fact when someone might have mentioned that, you know, in high school, I really didn't have a deadline. I could turn things in and my, anytime I needed to, my, my teacher was very lenient and they knew my medical conditions, you know, were chronic. So they worked with me and they gave me ain't, no time limit. It was on time. That would be unreasonable they, 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 um, to have something like that. Um, they, again, we cannot change the modality of a class, but we can provide student equal access. Okay. Yes, good point that uh, lots of them have unlimited time in high school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, are you ready for the next slide? Sure. Yeah, I, it, I just want to know, is the is extra time defined by time and a half or double time? Or is it is it is it totally removed? Extra time is defined by time and a half, 50% or double time, which is 100% correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I talked about this and previously about the combination letter, um, send to the instructor, we meet with the student virtually or online to do the process. Um, we advocate for that student at that point to stay connected with the semester, but we do something called temperature checks. We call them temperature checks because we send students emails throughout the semester at specific times to let them know Hey, these are important dates to remember. This is the drop date. This is the withdrawal date. Um, these are graduation dates. These are graduation application dates. So we do these temperature checks all throughout the semester so the students are aware that we're, we're checking in. And at and that point, we also let them know if there are any issues or concerns that they're having, please feel free to stop in or let me know what's going on. Um, because a lot of times we get things at the last hour and we, and we hate to try to put fires out at the last hour. Or we can do these early to try to advocate for these students. So again, like I was mentioning about self-identifying, engaging in our office. Uh, again, we again we call this the interactive process because we're talking, it's not just what we say, and again, it's what the students are also self-identifying and to to determine what's needed. So we, we look at, we, we listen to the students very intently to, to determine um, what their needs are based on not only on paper, but what they're also saying to us when we meet with them in person to determine what's reasonable to provide them on the, on the college level. Um, and he also mentioned about tutoring, I mentioned about student support services on campus. We have academic coaches, we have tutors. Um, one thing that I run into sometimes with some parents and some students, tutoring is not an accommodation in college. So tutoring is a free service, students have to, Again, advocate for themselves. We have we have office called student student support services. We have trio programs that students are eligible for who have disabilities, and they have one-on-one -on -one tutors there. They have group tutors there um, to help students throughout their whole matriculation and college. They just have to go and make appointments and make arrangements to meet with these tutors. Um, so that's one thing we have to make sure the students are aware of. Tutoring is not an accommodation on the college level. Um, academic coaches, we also have is, is another um, thing we built in with some of these special programs at the Community College of Baltimore County also because we run into some students who have issues with time management. So because of that, we, we feel that we can help um, connect them with an academic coach early on in, in their uh, mission to the, to the community college to have someone to sit with them to go over planning. Um, to maybe help them map out their schedules throughout the semesters so they're aware, 
you know, these are things that should be helpful for you so that you're not missing important dates. A lot of times that becomes an issue for a lot of students who have processing issues or might be having um, issues with just um, keeping time frames of what's going on. As far as the staff, again, we um, timely review of student documentation. I, I mentioned before about a seven day business time to get back to a student once they submit the documentation and application. Um, as far as engaging the student intake process, that goes again about the face to face and the virtual appointments. Um, when students have problems with their classes, we advocate for them with the faculty member, you know, so we help them in, in, in that capacity. And the last one is community disability education and advocacy. And so that's kind of what we're doing right now. So helping out BCPS, working with transition facilitators, and also we also have um, what we call it um, transition fair. Um, when the weather's nice, we were actually having you guys come to us. And that was a great opportunity for them to actually see the school, set our office, and meet the individuals face to face. Um, so they can see what we do at the community college. That's, and that's always been a, a good thing over the years. I mentioned again about these are the resources on campus, about the uh, academic coaches. Success navigators are, we should actually share, the, share a suite with navigators on the Kittenville campus. The individuals who might be going through any type of amount, mental health crisis, um, maybe displacement as far as housing, any type of issues they're having that could be affecting them for, for doing well in school that um, we call them real life situations. So we have navigators on campus that you can actually sit down and talk to to assist you in any way possible. It might be, you know, you just need, um, you're hungry, you might need food. So we those navigators have food pantries on campus to assist students in real life situations. So. That's the real a plus that we have at CCBC for those individuals who can meet with a navigator anytime yeah. that um, they're on campus to assist them in, that, in those capacities. Uh, yeah. These are our office um, locations and hours. The main campuses are Essex, Dundalk, and Catonsville. But we do have other campuses such as the Owens Mills location, but we do not have an office at that location. So we, with students who might be taking only classes at those satellite locations like Hunt Valley, Randallstown, or Owens Mills, we can meet with you, meet with those students virtually if they need to see us to get accommodations at those locations also. But if you need to see someone face to face on a campus, you need to come to one of our main campuses, which is Catonville, Essex, or Dundee. That is a quick overview. And I'm, I'm hoping that Mike has more questions or anybody else. <laughs> yeah, does anyone else have any other questions? I just uh, want to say, I just want to say thank you, you all for taking the time to um, walk us through the process. It's been a mystery to us for quite some time. It was something that we've been looking forward to. And you've definitely answered a lot of the questions that would help me in my um, personal journey, but also my professional journey um, as a special education teacher. This is the an elementary side that I don't necessarily see uh, that transition. But now that my kids are at this place, it's one of, the, one of the things that you guys have answered those questions. So thank you so much. One great thing about, you know, Mike just mentioned, it kind of triggered me to mention about the ECAP program and the dually enrolled program right now. We have a great program right now going on for students who are willing to start the process early and while they're still in the high school they can do that at ccbc so um they can take the placement test determine what kind of classes they actually can test into and they can start their classes now um each graduation year i hear about so many students who are actually graduating from a high school diploma and an aa degree and that's so wonderful mm. yes any other questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you, Amy and Michael, again, for giving us your time. I mean, you're not even getting paid for this on this nice day. So, I thought we're not. I, <laughs> I mean, we're educators. <laughs> um, but it just shows how much you care about kids that you, you know, 
give us your time like this. So that's good to know. I, I, I applaud you guys for actually showing up tonight on such a beautiful day outside. So we applaud you for catching show up, coming out tonight. Thank you for showing up. Yes. All right. Well, have a good night, everybody. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Okay. okay.